From Los Angeles, the home of film and television, this is Film Music Live, a webcast featuring outstanding composers, orchestrators, filmmakers, and more from the world of music for film, television, and video games, talking about their work and answering your questions. Film Music Live is sponsored by the Film Music Network and Film Music Institute. And now the host of Film Music Live, Daniel Schweiger. Hey everyone, I'm Daniel Schweiger, and welcome to Film Music Live, the show where you get to ask the questions to today's top composers. I'm happy to have you here. Blake Neely is a composer with more than enough experience fighting cosmic villainy with such superheroes as The Flash, The Green Arrow, and Supergirl. But it's a whole other matter of honor to play very real mortal men soaring into combat against Nazi evil. And on that artistic mission of musically piloting the masters of the air, Blake Neely takes home a medal for a symphonically impressive, gloriously old school war score for this impressive Apple Plus series co-produced by Tom Hanks for whom Neely's last mission approximated suspenseful sonar for the battleship versus submarine combat of Greyhound. Having earned his wings at the start of his Hollywood career orchestrating for the likes of Michael Kamen on The Iron Giant, conducting for Vangelis, and writing additional music for Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl, the musically self-taught Neely saw his creative relationship with Tom Hanks begin with Starter for Ten and The Great Buck Howard before taking on the first of his epic war miniseries with The Pacific, later becoming the house composer of the CW's DC-verse among numerous TV series that included Blind Spot, The Time Traveler's Wife, Riverdale, and an Emmy win for the kookily ingenious The Flight Attendant, Neely now creates some of his most impactfully impressive scoring to encompass America's air war over Europe, not only capturing the death-defying suspense of dogfights from a flying fortress's point of view, Neely captures the camaraderie of warriors going to potential doom with every mission, their great escapes when grounded, and the loss, victory, and lofty patriotism that's the time-honored stuff of scoring men in battle, as done for a small screen that's as wide as it gets in scope and emotion. And now here's a composer who soared with epic tales of war and heroism, never more so than with the masters of the air. Let's welcome to Film Music Live, Blake Neely. Hello, my friend. It's great having you here, Blake. Uh, you've done so much wonderful work for Tom Hanks's projects. Some of he's been in a lot he's produced. How did this whole partnership get started that has led to Masters of the Air? I have to thank James Newton Howard. He introduced me. He couldn't do this movie uh that Playtone was producing and he recommended me and I had a meeting and it was called The Wedding Date it was my first solo movie credit and um that's how we got started that was almost 19 years ago so we've been just about two decades together me and Playtone and they are just fantastic to work with well, I mean, and you're, you've done quite a few really impressive miniseries. Uh, you know, I've been a huge fan of the Tom Hanks's, you know, shows since uh, Band of Brothers, which this is essentially the continuation of. Um, and I think you kind of joined this whole thing with the the Pacific. Uh, when you're scoring like a war, you know, a war project, do you do research at all to to see, you know, the whole story of this? No. Well, I, actually, let me go back and start with um, I actually worked on Band of Brothers with Michael Kamen. He was my mentor. And uh, I was an orchestrator for him at the time. So I actually have been on all three of them. Uh, when Pacific came around, um, Jeff Hans reached out to me and Jeff Zanelli, and we uh, scored that. And then this one, I said to Gary Getzman, please just let me take this one. Let me have this for myself. So I was honored to do that. Um, to your question, do I do any research? I've actually seen so many war movies that that's just in my head. Um, someone was asking me if I'd read the book Masters of the Air, which I did not, sadly. But, um, you know, all of the I'm a pretty big history buff. So the war is pretty firmly up there. But then what I do is I just watch the entire series to get inspiration and to figure out what I'm going to what story I'm going to tell musically. 
what to you is the big musical difference between land, sea, and air? Ooh, that's very interesting. I think, I think for the Pacific, it was much more trudging and like slow, hard. Uh, and with this, what I want to do is the emotional bits are going to be the emotional bits. It's kind of the, where I start writing. Um, but the action had to be more intense, fast paced, the sense of flying rather than, you know, trudging along. So I think that was sort of it. And then once they, spoiler alert, once they get to the POW camp, it, it just, it, it gets a lot, I guess, graphic music, I would say. Um, I was trying to go for striking sounds and out of the, but still working with only orchestra, organic instruments. I didn't use any synths in this. Um, it was because it was a period piece. I just wanted to keep it in the orchestra. I mean, you know, what to you makes a great war score? Oh, a great war score can do both emotional and the action. Um, and a lot of times... I like when uh, when there's no music in the action. Like one of Michael Kamen's things on Band of Brothers was, I won't score the... He, he said I'd, he didn't want to score the action pieces. He just wanted to uh, score the more emotional bits of it, which I think really worked. Um, a lot of that approach is in Saving Private Ryan and uh, Platoon and, you know, all these great movies. But I think if you can really feel the the in the soul and the heart of what these men were going through not even men boys you know some of them are 19. if you can really dig into that uh i think you get a powerful score rather than just action 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 yeah right now here's our first question in that kind of theme from ivan sorkin um hi which war theme movie would you enjoy as a viewer and a listener and maybe one of them was the inspiration for masters of the air um that's a great question thank you ivan um I just said it, which is Saving Private Ryan. I, I really love that movie um, from beginning to end. I've seen it several times. I don't know if it was uh, inspired masters, but I definitely have been inspired by John Williams since I was eight years old and saw Star Wars. I mean, I just love the main theme of Masters in the Air. It just completely you. grabs you right from the start. What is, I mean, obviously having done so many shows, so many movies, what is the secret to a great theme like that? And particularly the 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 secret sauce for the theme of Masters of the Air. Man, the, the, the panic that sets in when you're starting to write a theme, especially for a series that you're going to need to come back to. And it's, and it's, here's a, I've done so many fictional characters. Here's, basically a documentary about real men who went through this and to write a theme that's going to hopefully be memorable and honor those characters, the, the real people. Um, it's just a, a panic <laughs> that starts. Um, it's actually the theme sore is what I first wrote for this after watching a couple of episodes and it took a while to find out, uh, to find it. And then just one night I was, literally in my living room playing my piano and, and came up with it and thought, okay, that might be the theme, but then I've got to produce it because I really wanted this sense of flying after, after the opening, I wanted it to take off and go in this sense of flying. Um, so I don't know, every time it's, it's kind of the same, uh, can I do this? Am I going to pull it off? Or is this, is this it? Did, am I out of themes? And so basically, I guess it was the theme first. And how does it translate to these characters? Because there are a lot of characters and it kind of switches between uh, who you're watching, you know, who, who you're there with. I never really used the, this theme. On, I was careful because, you know, you're going to hear it nine times. You're going to hear it every week if you don't skip. And I didn't want to have, you know, oh, there's the theme again. Um, so I was careful about when we used it. But that theme became about the entire uh, all of our uh, pilots <laughs> when they're all doing something together. Um, and then I had other themes. I probably used, came up with about five themes that I would go to um, back and forth. There's a, there's a theme for just Buck and Bucky. There's a, there's a theme for, there's a few battle themes. Um, and there's the closing credits, which I called going home. I, I use that sometimes when the characters are, are missing home or just 
that's that's really their mission is just to get home safely. So that is uh, kind of what I did as far as a theme package that I could go to without going to one or two too many times. Now, I'd love to talk about Austin Butler's uh, character yeah. on the show. He really, you know, he's way older than his years. And, you know, he really has a command of the situation where a lot of these characters don't. He's essentially the father figure at an impossibly young age and then he disappears for a couple of episodes and it's like is he dead or not but he's in the great escape camp how, how did you unhandle his character to reflect that a lot of uh a lot with both callum and with austin a lot of it is uh, callum's one that plays egan um i mean we had just such an amazing cast with barry and anthony and nate they're all stunning actors um but a lot of it was staying out of the way. It's like just support. I like to not be too overt with scoring, except in the action, I'm very <laughs> over the top. But it's just a lot of support and knowing when when to just get out and when to and when to let them just act. Um, one of the one of the amazing, probably one of the hardest scenes I've scored. Uh, it's in episode three when Clevin is just looking out at all the the disaster, the carnage in the air, and it goes to just music over sound. And all your he's doing the entire thing with just his eyes. You know, his face is covered and he's just looking out and it's incredible what he can deliver that way. Same with Callum, same with, and, the, and they're wonderful guys. I've gotten to meet them over this several year process. So it just, I wish, uh, I wish we had a season two. I'd love to score them again. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no world war three yet but how how long has this gone on for i mean this seems to this it seems to have taken years to to get it to this point yeah they were filming during the pandemic um so i i started writing in july of 22 and uh finished my recordings of everything all episodes by by january of 23 last year and then they mixed for months and months and months so i would say the whole thing's about three years from being and that they've been making it for 10 you know with the writing and finding the material but the actual from shooting to when we finished was about three years wow now we're going to in terms of years we're going to be jumping about your pretty incredible career through the show which brings us to our first uh, question from john anderson tell us about working with vangelis on alexander Okay, well, I must teach everyone here. It's Vangelis. There's no soft G in Greek. So it's Vangelis. I did not work on Alexander. Um, I worked on, I met him to do a, a transcription and orchestration of his um, Methodia, which is a 10-part epic symphonic poem. And, and then I stayed on, uh, I was on that for about a year and a half. In a, ended up conducting it. It's on YouTube, Methodia, and he was just incredible to work with. He's like a he was like a brother and a father all at once. Um, I got to play his synths. I got to sit in his room and we would talk for hours and hours and at night. And um, I spent about half a year with him on and off in Athens. And he was very trusting. He just said, "Here it is." He did, he didn't work with MIDI. He just handed me a, a DAT tape, and I did a by ear takedown. Um, and he sent me to London to record it and by myself and came back. It was just, just amazing. And then he had me back for, uh, the FIFA, a theme that he did for the FIFA final draw. And I ended up orchestrating that and then going to Korea to conduct it. And we stayed in touch over the years. And sadly he's gone two years ago, almost next month. It'll be two years. You know, I did a th I think I did a thing on him for uh, his amazing score for the bounty, and I'm wondering how much how much of his work was just pure improvisation, just basically okay, I'm just gonna start playing stuff, and and there's the score. Well, from my knowledge and talking with him, he was really great at improvising, but he would he would work on a theme, and then he has this elaborate keyboard setup that all so basically. All I think it was twelve or fifteen cents are playing at once, and he just has pedals, and he pedals them in. And I watched him playing, and with like this hand, he's playing the horn melody. With his thumb, he's triggering the timpani, 
and then he's playing bass and he's got a string off not i mean phenomenal keyboard player and he's just pedaling in the sounds so uh really great improviser um i never got to watch him like work on a film uh but from watching him and doing the concert with him it's fantastic really miss him yeah no he, he was great and sor sorely missed um, now, Aaron uh, has a question. Your credits in action and larger-than-life hero films are impressive. Can you tell us about your workflow when spotting, and what are your go-to te go techniques for orchestration? Thanks, Aaron. Um, I am, I've been doing this so long now and have basically been doing it with the same people. Uh, Greg Berlanti, Gary Getzman, Ryan White. They're mainly my benefactors for the past 22, 23 years. And... My point about that is we've gotten to a point where we don't spot anymore. I do self-spotting. So they send it to me. I figure out where I, where I want to put the music or where I think it should go. And then I write and then I present. And if it's too early or too late, we'll move the spotting around. But I, I do that myself because I told them years ago, like, I can't sit in the conference room or edit bay and tell you what I'm going to do with the score. I have to show you. So if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But let me just try. So that's always been my approach. And I just, I watch it silently and I just feel where I think music should go. Um, that's my process there. And then when it comes to orchestration, I, I try to do something that's appropriate and also uh, in some ways, hopefully I haven't worked in that orchest or orchestration medium before. Like with the flight attendant, I stuck myself in my own box by suggesting that it be an all percussion score. And then when they said, yeah, great, <laughs> I thought, well, how am I going to do this? Um, so with this one, with with Masters of the Air, I knew it was all going to be organic instruments. I knew I didn't want to use much piano or harps or anything like that. Um, and so it became, how do I do that in a new way? And so that's my approach with orchestration. Wow. Um, there are so many great musical moments in this series, and I have to say one of my favorites is the sequence where they're trying to fix the wheel of the Flying Fortress right before it takes off as it's taxing down. Uh, tell me about doing that sequence. You know, it's, yeah, I, I realized that in a lot of these big sequences, there's not much dialogue. So um, it was really... It was really not, I wouldn't say difficult, just it was really fun to to do those kinds of scenes. And I wanted to make it sort of thrilling because he's actually he's got to fix this thing before it takes off and he gets out just in time. And Lemons was such a great character to score. Um a lot of that I heard, and a lot of that scene I kind of improvised as I was watching it and went, Oh, okay. And ended up with this weird key center that i just couldn't figure out but it's what i heard so I went with it um another sequence that was really painful to score is but also zero dialogue is uh coming in episode nine when they uh do find the concentration camp so there's a lot of those scenes that you know you get in this series because tom and gary and steven they just they let things sit they let the, they let it simmer and they let uh, you just, they're not in any rush. They're just letting you be in it. So that was, uh, quite a dream to score. You know, in, in any show like this, I imagine you <laughs> in fight with the sound effects technicians who also oh. do an amazing job. Just the effects in this are just incredible. How, yeah. how did you just like talk to them before you even started this thing? Okay. Here's music and here are your effects just to avoid I, any kind of conflicts. Yeah, I talked to them along the way. If they're, I just, you know, we it's like, please don't do any drones. Like, let me handle that kind of stuff with the orchestra. Um, but I knew that that I I knew early on what that was going to sound like up there. It was always going to have kind of a hum inside the plane. The battle sequences you've, you're you're fighting against, pardon the pun, bullets and planes falling apart and explosions. But I tend to just write what I'm going to write and. Try to stay out of the range you know if i know that there's a lot of hum here i'll write high and low if uh if there's a heavy battle sequence i'll avoid percussion and then sometimes i don't then sometimes i'm like i'm gonna score it as if there's no sound here and they'll figure it out they've got stems they can mute it and mike minkler and the team were just amazing with that um 
to figure it out and we, we each have our turns you know sometimes they go just music and sometimes it was i had music there <laughs> it's just sound effects or a little bit of a little bit of from me but not all that's in the queue um and i've learned a lot over 12 years of doing superhero tv that uh you know that's kind of my training for doing these loud loud epic movies i did the same thing on greyhound it was figure out my role and then just do it and uh i i think and this is sort of geeky but i think if you underwrite if i don't write the percussion feeling like or if i don't put the bass in because you're not going to hear the bass i think you feel it as an audience you know you can tell that oh the composer is avoiding those ranges because it's going to compete so i just do it and it and it fills it up in a nice way now, well, you mentioned this a little bit, but uh, Louie would love to hear some tips about networking and writer's block. Ooh, writer's block. Wow. That is something, Louie, that I uh, uh, hope it's Louie, not Lewis. I don't know, but thanks for the question. Um, writer's block is something that I used to just shut me down, like literally in a fetal position in the corner. Um, and I realized... It, you just got to push through it. So I will either go do something else completely, get away from music. Um, sometimes it just takes a walk to Starbucks to figure it out. I will work on something else. If I have multiple projects, I'll just move to something else. Um, I sometimes will pull up an old queue or a previous queue, start working with that and just changing it. And then sometimes it just hits you. So I try not to get shut down by writer's block anymore. There's there's the panic, as I talked about. Um, but Hans Zimmer said to me one time, I said, I fear running out of ideas. And he said, I don't think we'll ever run out of ideas. It's ideas are what push the world forward in all ways. Um, and I think about that. And then I just wait and hopefully let it come. As far as networking goes, I'm not sure if you're talking about a network of Composers are networking in the business, but like I said, I've been very lucky with the people that have believed in me these, these past two decades, and they just keep making great stuff. No, absolutely. Um, I mean, I just love Greyhound, another really terrific project with Tom Hanks. And what's really interesting there is because the score is the sound effect for a lot of it, where it's sonar. Uh, yeah. What were the challenges? Oh, you got that, huh? You got that. Oh, absolutely. I, yeah, I was I was spelling things out in in uh, in Morse code, and there's there's one scene where I, where it's it's spelling out things in Morse code, um, and that just became a, a fun thing that I was like, no one's gonna know that I'm doing this. Just like people don't know that I played my refrigerator in the flight attendant, but I did. Um, so yeah, Greyhound was really interesting in that. I wrote its theme first, um, and then there was nowhere to use it until the very end, which was an interesting score for me. I could hint at it. I could do like a couple of bars, but it just wasn't that type of movie that you could just play the all-out theme. And then with uh, Gary Getzman said, you know, the whole thing is amps up the entire way. So careful you don't blow everything you have in the first battle because there's five more to go. So it was just an exercise in how do you build tension, keep building tension, keep building tension, and just don't let it up. And that, that was interesting to spot because it was like, do we get out for a minute? Do we keep going? You know, what makes it more tense? Wow. Uh, what to you is the biggest difference between Superman, Supergirl, and these and like a, a fake superhero and a real life superhero? Well, scoring wise, uh, I think with the superheroes, you kind of you kind of always have to give the light motif when they show up, you know, and I like with the Flash, he had a running theme, he had a hero theme, he had all this. And then it's, it's kind of like he'd show up and there's the theme. I can't do that every time the masters of the air come on. It, it becomes cheesy. These are real guys and, and they don't really need a light motif and you pay attention a little more. So. That's sort of my difference as far as um, writing goes. The pressure is the same because on the one hand, you're coming up with music for real people who really live this. And then on the other side with the superheroes, 
you're writing a theme for characters that have been around for 85 years and they have a massive fan base and you can't screw that up with a bad theme. So it's pressure, but I love it. On that note, I mean, you you were the king of the CW universe. I don't think there was a show that you weren't scoring, uh, which brings us to a question from Jake. Um, how, how do you handle so many shows at the same time, especially in this particular television universe? Well, it's no secret that I, I built a great team around me. Um, and with the superheroes, that's when I started the team building and I bought the studio and converted it. I've got rooms upstairs and I just started reaching out to friends of mine and, and we started, they started doing additional music for me. And eventually I went to Greg and said, I want to get them co-writer credit and I want them, we want to share these shows together. Um, so that it became, you know, I tell students, like, if you just do one show to the best of your ability, just just worry about doing one show, one series to the best of your ability, one project, and then multiples. It didn't happen all at once. I didn't suddenly get 10 TV shows. I had one, and then I had two, and then it built up. And you just kind of figure out how to do it. I've got really good templates that I work with. I've got really good help and people and music editor. My music editor, Angela, is a genius. Um, so yeah, help. And then when something like Masters comes in, it's like, all right, everybody out. This is mine. I want all this. This is mine. And um, so yeah. And I'm also always working. <laughs> that's one way. That, that's that's a good thing. Um, I mean, if you don't mind me asking, yeah, are there me. any? Oh, that's weird. Um, if you don't mind me asking, do you have any you know relatives or people in your family's past who were in the service, who were in in battle? Yes, I have an uncle who was actually, uh, he actually died on the, in Africa. Um, and he worked on, he, he had a, he was a pilot. Um, and then I had another uncle who was in, I believe, Hawaii or Guam during the, during the, the World War II. And he fixed planes. So not only do I have military ancestors, like they seem to have worked on planes. Wow. I mean, what's that responsibility like in a way? Uh, for me? To, to basically honor them with a show like this, to honor, you know, because essentially you know, it's a patriotic score, but there's a darkness to the patriotism in this for quite a bit of it, where it's like, you know, you feel the sacrifice of, yeah. of these characters. Yeah, I always, I didn't ever want to do like horror. I didn't ever want to make uh, a scary score i want it to be it could be action it could be big it'd be bold it could be emotional but never too dark um because ultimately these guys saved the world and you know they are heroes and uh they went through some dark tragic things and we have that but um honoring them or honoring my uncles it was it was all just about it didn't matter the person just a just wanted to honor the hero that that they were um there's some difficult stuff though to you know scoring bit it going down and and I got emails the next day going what he's on the poster and I go anybody can die in this thing it's war um yeah. there was a there was just a delicacy of like I I don't want to do anything too grand I you know like like the main title I just really wanted to nail the tone um and not make it a, a dirge or or anything. I'm going to go to our question from Louis Versalini. Um, of all the series that you've scored, which one was the most fun scoring and which was the most challenging? I think this was the most challenging. Um, definitely the, the flight attendant was fun, like a lot of fun. Um, and I really enjoyed doing the superheroes or I wouldn't have done them for so long. I mean, I did five superhero shows and, and, the most fun out of those is the uh, the crossover episodes. Those were just enormous amount of music <laughs> and figuring out and puzzles to solve. Wow. Um, we're again we're about going back into that episode. You know where the character uh, forgive me I can't remember his name, but the wonderful actor from Saltburn. Uh, I, I just loved his character. And I was sorry to see him not make that cliff uh, on the episode uh, where he does get killed. He made the first one. He made the first one. Uh, tell me about scoring that that character. 
Uh, Biddick was an interesting character. He he was just, I mean, what a guy, right? He'd get in fights and he was, uh, you know, he was just kind of, he was a, he was a wild dog. Um, I didn't get many scenes with just Biddick uh, to score, but definitely the, the, him going down was a, was a rough one. Wow. Yeah, it's a bummer. I, I miss him. Now we've got a question from Richard Rock, composer Sandbox. Uh, thank you both for the session. With your career spanning the transition from traditional to streaming TV, how do you think the shift has affected the role and expectations of music in television? Um, I That's a good question, Richard. I will answer it uh, the same way I have a, answered when people say, how do I approach film composing as opposed to television? And I got started in this when we were heading into the golden age of television, meaning the uh, the new way of doing things. And the effects were big and the sound was big. And when I was, just before I got into this, there were actually two sets of speakers in a mixing studio. And one was for television, one was for film. And I just never approached it that way. I was like, well, whether it's TV or an ad or a video game or a movie, it's all going to be scored cinematically because with specifically like with streaming now, you're going to watch Masters, a TV show on the same device as you're going to watch The Avengers, same as you're going to watch, you know, Maestro. So I, it just needs to be the highest quality possible, whether it's the CW or Apple um, or Amazon. So I don't, I don't approach any differently. And I think what's great is that we have so much content that we can, you know, there, we joke that you can throw a rock and hit a composer in LA, but there's so much content that we can all like have these great projects to work on. Wow. When I, when I literally, when I started, there were, I think each year there were 10 shows that you could vie for. So now it's, you know, hundreds of projects. And it really seems to me that music is a lot more interesting in television now. And, and I think even better especially Masters of the Air is an excellent example of, of getting like an epic war score that I expect to see in a $50 million film. And here it is on and look Apple at the, TV+. Look, look at the cast we have. I mean, you can't, you can't make, and everyone's doing everything now. Meryl Streep does TV. So it's, it's wow. really, it's really uh, great, the platform they have. And they sound fantastic. I mean, that Masters, if you play it through the, uh, you know, the Atmos that it was mixed in. It sounds incredible. Now I've got a question from Dale. Um, tell me about military film scoring cliches and what are they and how do you avoid them? And when do you need to rely on them to go for that bugle or the trumpet or the soaring strings? Snare drum. The snare drum. Snare drum. Biggest cliche in, in military is snare drum, but sometimes you got to do it. Um, I think that's it. I, I don't think fanfares are cliche. I think I don't think that anybody, I mean, fanfare has been with us since the time of Haydn. So uh, yeah, that's my big one is, is snare drums. But if it works, it works. You know, there's a reason why it's really hard to use uh, banjo in the superhero show. It's just not what you're expecting to hear. So I think cliches are sometimes okay. Um, Maybe don't, we don't call them cliches, just like what you normally are expected to hear. Um, but like I was saying before the studio exploded, um, I also like to try things that are very different from what you're seeing or hearing uh, or expecting to hear. And you can just bring out a whole nother level of the story, which I find to be magical about music. Now, Louis would like to know do, if you still study comp composition and orchestration, and if so, what books or scores do you like studying? Um, he personally likes to study how Wagner develops light motives. Yeah, I have from uh, ever since high school, I've store, score studied, um, and I grew up without an internet because I'm old, and uh, so I would actually go to the library. I would get a check out a cassette or CD or vinyl, and then I would get the score and I would just study it. And that's how I learned orchestration um, was through doing that. And I still learn, yes, I still study orchestration. Um, I still buy scores and, 
and read through them and just try ideas. And I'm, I have to study my own sometimes. I mean, I'm, you're not finished with the orchestration until you're hearing it on the stand and you stop the orchestra and say, yeah, let's change that. I don't think that's the correct voicing there. So it's a, it's always, you can never master it. You can never, you can't master music, you know? So I'm studying orchestration through others scores and the masters and uh, not masters of the air, master composers. And I'm studying composition. I'm always listening to new music. Um, yeah. I don't think I'll ever stop. Why, why stop learning? Absolutely. What's what's the biggest thing you've learned? What are like some of the big lessons? Um, I think what I've learned is I'm glad that I wasn't allowed to study music in school. They said, no, do something else. Because I think if I had had this whole music pedagogy really drilled into me, I wouldn't do some of the things that are required for scoring some bold directional changes or, you know, not figuring out the correct way to modulate to that, just do it, you know, so some of those things I'm thankful for because it just developed a different style and is not based on any rules. So I don't, I don't have to think I'm breaking any rules. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've learned a lot from other scores like, oh my gosh, that's how you do that. You know, Mahler is one of the greatest orchestrators ever so underrated and you look at his scores you're like he, he, you're never gonna hear the flute down there by itself and then of course there it is so i, I love figuring things out like that i mean you know obviously the missions are the highlight of the show uh how did you how do you structure them uh you know the beginning to the end of these things uh, you know it's the, the the flying missions and in, in masters of the air well early on that is a a large discussion that Gary gets when I had, he said, it's going to be confusing up there because they're wearing masks. Uh, it's hard to understand them. It's also directionally, you're not sure what you're looking at. So he said, I need music to really help tell the story in those battles. You don't have to push emotion so much in those battles, but you need to help tell story. So I would, I would block out the scene, literally block out the scene of like, I need to tell this here. And then when we get here, I need to tell this. And then when we get back here, repeat that. And you you kind of through not knowing it are aware of who you're dealing with by orchestrational shifts. <clears throat> or like, oh, this, this guy will be heavy percussion. This will be heavy ostinato. And wide shots will employ both, you know, that kind of thing. So I did block out the scenes. You kind of have to. <laughs> Wow. Now, obviously, you know, we're going to kind of get out of the, the prison camp, um, yes. you know, in the, in the final episode. But what's it like being, you know, I, I, I like how it essentially ties into the great escape, you know, the, the classic film, but it's in the whole other part of the camp. What's the what's the mood shift like, you know, to suddenly, you know, jump from England or, you know, their base to Germany? I did not. I don't score geography. Not not really in anything like I mean, if, if if I was scoring something in China, I would not use Chinese instruments. I, you know, unless you have to. But I didn't think I'm scoring them being in Germany or I'm scoring them in England or in the air on the ground. Um, it's just their their characters have developed quite a bit. And the war has developed quite a bit. So it was more about piling on. Um so it just gets heavier as they get, you know, when they, when they get to the POW camp, it just gets heavy. It's uh, not dark, just kind of heavy music. Um, and there's a scene coming up where they march them through the this winter march a very long way, mm. the prisoners. And, and that was like, I just wanted this trudging sound, like slogging through mud. Um, so that's kind of what it, what it was. I never thought about where they were. I mean, I did think about story-wise where they were, but not musically telling you where they are. I don't really know what the we're in Germany sound sounds like. But <laughs> Get some Wagner I'm going inspired on. Inspired by Bach there. And yeah. Um, so that was, that's kind of my approach there. Is just stick with the guys. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing about, you know, you can imagine that a lot of the people are going to just binge like nine hours, like 10 hours of this straight straight up. You know, it, it's the whole binge thing now. I've, I've, I've been guilty of that myself. But, you know, I think in any, even like any kind of war epic, there's a sense of a journey, uh, like mm -hmm. how bad are things are going to get, you know, or it just totally grips you, you know, with suspense. And then finally, there's the historical release of the war is over. What, what's it like just capturing that kind of emotion to the obviously the war is going to end in the next episode, which is Friday, uh, to kind of capture that emotional journey? Way to, way to spoil it, Daniel. No, <laughs> when, I was, when I was putting the soundtrack together, Apple said, please don't. No spoilers in the titles of the songs because uh, <laughs> the soundtrack came out in episode one. They always come out in the first. All these albums come out literally in the first episode, and I'm like, yeah. what? <laughs> and uh, and they said, no, we think it'll be nice to have it out, you know, and then people can discover those pieces as the series goes on, which is right. cool. But I had this one track. It's called "War Is Over," and I said, that's that can't be considered a spoiler because everybody knows the war ended. Anyway. I think what I what I liked doing in the score to just build it and build it was um, repetition. If you I think if you do it right, it becomes so unnerving. You know, like a, a theme, a melody is not very unnerving because you kind of you know, especially if you know the theme, you'll know when it's going to end. But with repetition just in your face, it's like make it stop. You know, just sort of gunfire of. There's there's a long long uh, like eight minute battle scene that the strings just are constant. Like I had I was like, come on guys, sorry, I know you're gonna be playing for eight minutes, but we gotta we gotta play, um, and just to keep it relentless, so that then when it finally does break, you're as just as relieved as the guys who were up there battling it. Like that that first drop on the uh, on uh, on the ball bearings plant. Mm -hmm. That whole buildup is a very long, tense buildup to finally the relief when they actually drop the bomb. Um, the scene where they're flying to Africa, you know, it took them, I don't know, 15 hours or 12 hours or something to fly to Africa. And um, so that landing cue, I didn't do a staccato kind of relentlessness, but I did a relentless, like almost atonal thing to like make it stop, <laughs> let us land. Right. Let us get there. I really love how the Tuskegee Airmen uh, are now have come into the show. What what was it like scoring them and getting across the the, the whole other fight that these brave pilots are enduring? Oh, I didn't approach them any differently. It's just they're sort of late to the party. So the main thing was is, is orchestrationally in the percussion. I was always adding elements and adding elements. So they got this nice new fresh batch of percussion on them to uh it's like okay boys you're here now let's go but you've missed a lot let's do this so i i didn't they don't have a special theme or anything um but the thing that i found so striking about that episode is that opening where they're told we don't think any of you are going to make it back but you have to do this mission and they all agree so the heroism that i tried to put into that opening of episode eight is was uh something I really worked on just the, I mean, imagine being told that, you know, yeah. and you're, you're 19 and 20 and you're, you just have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Um, now I have to do a throwback to probably might be my favorite score of yours. And my favorite movie of yours is the great Buck Howard. Oh yeah. I remember years ago you told me that. Yeah. So funny. You know, my 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 idea for that, speaking of writing block, is I try to come up with ideas that uh, put myself sort of in some constraints, some rules that I find it even more freeing to put these rules on myself um, or just an idea. And before I wrote a note, I said, you know what it would be fun is if the Great Buck Howard, if the score sounded like it was played by or written by the Tonight Show Band. And that was my whole idea. And from that, I took it in and came up with this score. But it's it's rules like that, like the no percussion, I mean, the all percussion, or the no percussion, or the no synths, or the only synths, or, um, you know, needs to sound like the Tonight Show wrote it. Yeah, and I just I just love, you know, essentially uh, John Malkovich is the amazing Kreskin. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, and again, you know, just big props to the flight attendant. You know, you keep hearing, you know, okay, let's have something that doesn't sound like something else. And this is really super unique use of percussion and just a, a thoroughly fun uh, series. That was a lot of fun. They, they, uh, I came back from my first meeting with them where I'd pitched them all percussion. And then in the elevator, I was like, what did I do to myself? And then I came back and as an experiment, I just started writing this thing and this two minute piece. And I sent it over to the showrunner and I was like, what do you think? It's just, and he, and he went, that's an excellent, it's an excellent, off to a great start. And then they took that piece and they made the main title around it. And I won an Emmy. It's like, that was just an experiment to see if, if this was going to work and it just became the sound of the show. So, um, I wasn't even thinking at the time about ideas of writer's block. I was just having fun. And then that became the thing. And also I want to give a, a shout out to Riverdale. Uh, you know, I mean, given, okay, here's Archie, but it's real. Yeah. You know, it, it's not a goofy. And it's a murder mystery. Yes. What's the challenge? And then it's dark. And then it's, um, when I started Riverdale, the idea was, uh, you know, I looked at their, how it was shot and sets and, props and it's very anachronistic you know they've got they're in a 50s diner in 50s cars but they're talking on cell phones so it really became and when he types it's on an old typewriter and nobody has a laptop so it's it was it's sort of a timeless you don't really know what the time period is so i thought well i'm gonna do the same thing with the score which is anything i can have oboe banjo choir and organ in a queue if I want. Anything can work. And that became the the idea behind that score. And then we get into the supernatural and we get into the mass murderer and serial killer and it just it just went off the rails. Then yeah, no, very very true. I mean now as we wrap our show up, I mean where I'm sure there's got to be another World War II mini series in all of this. Where where would it go? Well, we haven't done we haven't done the Navy because Greyhound wasn't officially part of this triptych. Um, I mean, we've done the Navy through Greyhound, but that's a or the Pacific kind of fictional character. Yeah, a little bit, but that was Army, right? Um, so we jokingly said that we could do the Coast Guard. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, will, I will, I will, anything those my friends at Playtone and Amlin ever want to bring me i'll do they're they're just fantastic to work with and apple for that matter just great great people to work with and feel very privileged that i'm able to it's it's absolutely a great series and great scoring what, what's up ahead for you well i've got a couple of all americans that i'm scoring uh still doing that for cw um i have a documentary i'm working on currently and i have two ballet commissions for the right. year, this year, next year. So I'm keeping busy. Well, you're doing a great job. So I guess my, my final question is, what's it like for you to really be able to chronicle World War II like few other composers have been able to in, this, in like a true epic that's gone on for hours and all the various arenas of battle? Uh, it's it's funny, uh, you, you forget, I tend to forget a lot of it. Like these series that I do, I tend to forget after some time has passed. And so it's been really nice to go back and watch this after having not worked on it for a year. Um, and just remember these stories, these these incredible stories that happened. I, I need to go back now and watch the Pacific again. Um, it's It feels really good to have this be such a part of my legacy now, um, whenever that comes to you know whenever my legacy becomes necessary i'm gonna keep working until i until i drop but it feels really special to have had these chances and these prestige series to work on um so i don't know if that answers it for you but it's how i feel I've, i feel very honored to to have been asked to write the backdrop for these series and these men well, and there's also, done... there's also after after next week there's a documentary version called the bloody hundredth which is basically it's uh i think it's an hour-long documentary that i also scored 
that tells the true story of what you just saw. So anyone that says that didn't happen, you'll see it did in the bloody hundredth. Um, that was a very interesting because I was telling the same story, but not using any of the music from Masters. So that became a challenge. Like, oh, I've scored this Rosie coming back by himself scene. Oh, but I got to do it differently. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Well, Blake, again, just congratulations on a really terrific series and scoring. I want to thank you so much for joining us at Film Music Live. I want you all to watch Masters of the Air on Apple Plus TV with Blake's score available on Apple Music. And a big thanks to Deanna Ramirez at Accolade Publicity and Consultant. And thanks to our designer, Mark Banning, our producer, Dale Turner, and our executive producer, Mark Northam. And I'll be seeing you on the next Film Music Live on the 18th at 10 a.m. as we are joined by Volker Bertelman, a.k.a. Hauschka, to talk about One Life. Thanks for everyone for joining us. Love that guy. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks for everybody for showing up and thanks for great questions.